Okay, so um, if you are watching this live, I only have about a little over 10 minutes maybe to provide what uh, I hope will be a, a useful yet brief and incomplete introduction to For Against Darkness. I do plan to do some kind of a review where I can collect my thoughts and with a little more precision maybe give a... Give a uh, an idea of how the game is played and you know that what I like about it and the basic mechanics of how it works and stuff but I'm gonna take a shot at doing some of that right now this is a and don't run away if this initially turns you off but this is largely a um, a paper and pencil dungeon crawl that you are I mean you can use a dry erase mat to map out your dungeon, but the rules assume that you're using just graph paper, like old school D&D &D and similar games. Uh, and so you are starting at the entry point of a dungeon, and you roll on a table to determine what the shape of your starting room will be. Uh, that's what these uh, here are. Those are all your possible starting rooms. And then all of these are the options of, of how those rooms could branch off. Now, you might think, looking at, at graph paper, that this is going to be a game that's tactical and, you know, positioning is really important, things like that. It's really not that kind of game at all. In fact, the shapes of these rooms don't have any relevance to gameplay, you know, on, on an encounter-by-encounter encounter basis, apart from whether or not they are a room or a corridor, because that will uh, determine whether or not all of your party members can be involved in combat or just the ones in the front or back row. Now over here, uh, these are not components that come with the game. There are some uh, cards that you can buy uh, at uh, drive through RPG, I think it's called, a print-on-demand website, that are officially licensed for use with this game uh, that will provide art and monster stats. And I did invest in those some. Um, these here are minis from various games that I have, and then I used some tiles from Descent First Edition to basically create one uh, area that I can use when I'm dealing with a room encounter, and another that I can use when I'm dealing with a corridor encounter. And so just for your uh, viewing of this, I kind of propped up, uh, tried to figure out a way where I could, in a succinct, concentrated way, represent the room so you could at least see how I'm ordering my guys in front row or back row. That's the most that matters. Beyond that, positioning is not really relevant. Um, and, uh, and then what enemy that they are facing. And this game, you know, in fact, I'll keep the camera here for a moment as I make this point, really functions for me as a game, a tabletop version of early Final Fantasy type dungeon crawling, early Dragon Quest slash Dragon Warrior type dungeon crawling, if we're talking about video games here, or early wizardry likes, um, games that are turn-based, grid-based dungeon crawls that are just about the dungeons, not about walking around town, talking to NPCs and stuff like that. If you just want to crawl the dungeons, fight the monsters, make a clean sweep, get the loot, get the XP, level up, make your guys more capable in their equipment and in their abilities, and then go back into the dungeon and do it again, but against harder stuff. And rinse and repeat. If that is appealing to you, that type of video game or that type of tabletop experience, then I think Four Against Darkness is worth checking out because it is um, not since really HeroQuest, I think, have I played a game that really strips out any unneeded complexity to give you that core dungeon crawl experience. However, despite stripping out so much, Four Against Darkness really allows, in its very simple streamlined rules, for a wide variety of ways to interact with the world. In fact, even though there's not much in the way of a role-playing system, there are non-violent ways that you can proceed through encounters. There are opportunities to bribe monsters. Um, there are monsters that might end up giving you quests that you can go and complete and then bring back proof of the completion to them to get a reward. And all of this is randomly generated. There are uh, different ways that you can modify this game. In fact, that's a big part of what this game uh, has become. It comes with a very uh, basic rule book. Let me see if I can find it. 
this is the, the basic rule book. You can get it in PDF format, which I did initially, but then decided I wanted a physical copy just because it's easier to kind of uh, peruse and stuff. It doesn't have the search functionality that I miss a little bit from the PDF version, but I can go back and forth. Either way, this is, I want to say, $12 to $16 um, on, uh, on Amazon. Um, and uh, this is really just the beginning of the experience. It's the price point is great because it's a nice uh, nice entry level, but don't be deceived and think that you'll be able to get the full experience or the experience that most people playing this game are getting because most people buy uh, other supplements to flesh it out. Uh, depending on what more you want from it. Do you want more role-playing type stuff? Do you want more character classes? Do you want more monsters? Do you want to introduce uh, a Cthulhu style or Lovecraftian style sanity system like the video game Dar uh, uh, Darkest Dungeon has? These, they're all different ways you can kind of both mechanically and aesthetically pimp out your game as it, as it were. Um, but that does require more investment. And in my review, I'll talk more, I think, about that. Um, but anyway, um, what, uh, um, let's see, what else do I want to say before I kind of really dive into this? Um, the combat is not complex in this game. It's very straightforward. You are largely rolling a single die. Um, the enemy does not roll defense dice. They have a level attribute. All of your characters and enemies have a level, like in most RPGs. And that number uh, is the most significant modifier when it comes to figuring, resolving different types of rolls. Um, when you are making an attack roll, it's just a simple roll against their level. If you succeed, then oftentimes they'll just die if there's a regular monster. Um, it, then you'll, you, you usually, in fact, Exclusively, you fight monsters of the same kind in groups, so you're not going to run into like orcs and goblins together, uh, except in the sense of them being together in the dungeon. So these encounters move pretty quickly, and in that way, it reminds me of early Final Fantasy uh, installments, early Dragon Warrior slash Dragon Quest installments, where the combat is pretty simple. In some, sometimes in those games, you're just hammering the attack button in some encounters every now and then. Oh, this enemy is weak to this, so I should use this strategy. It's similar here. The combat encounters, the resolution of those combat encounters are pretty straightforward. Uh, I think that what this game captures for me is that feeling of simple, straightforward con combat that still has some interesting choices in it. You can't just be totally brain dead about the combat. Um, but it's more about that push your luck. Have I purchased enough healing potions? Like before you even go into the dungeon, how many healing potions should I buy? I want to be saving up money in the background to upgrade my guys in more lasting ways, but I need healing potions for this dungeon. How much do I think I'll need? Or potions of a different kind? Um, yeah, how much do I want to supply myself to get through the whole dungeon? And then when you're in the dungeon, you're thinking, okay, can I make it three more rooms? two more rooms, maybe just one, dare I do just one more room. And so it's that kind of push your luck and push your resources to see how far into the dungeon you can go because you can always turn back and you can leave. And, um, but I mean, in the base rules, I think the expectation there is that you, uh, you, you can't come back to that dungeon. I've modified it. This game is just known for how people choose to modify it. One reason for that is that, unfortunately, as pretty much every review of this game will tell you, um, for English speakers, I'm thinking maybe the, the designer of this game, English is not their native language. Perhaps they translated it after doing the, the core work in their native language. Maybe they translated it to English. I'm not sure what the reason is, but now and then there'll be some things about the rules that are unclear, and the layout of the book is notorious for uh, being difficult to navigate and n not having a clear sense of organization. You know, finding one part about combat in the front half of the rules, and then somewhere deep in the back. Another thing that's relevant to combat is, is back there somewhere. There is a, a, a nice uh, table of contents to help you make your way through the game. Uh, through the game rules, um, but you know, just reading it once um, is not going to get you where you need to be to really be proficient at all the rules. In fact, 
what you'll notice as I play this game, I won't actually start playing it today, but what you'll notice, uh, unless you're watching the, the archived version of this, I'll just stitch two parts together and we'll get right into it when I'm done with my opening remarks here. But um, what you'll notice with a lot of people, I think, that play this game is it's easy to get rules wrong. It's easy to forget rules. And that's because learning them to begin with is hard. And, and when you aren't sure about a rule... Sometimes, especially if you're playing solo like me, you're like, I'm just going to make a call right now. I don't feel like digging through the rule book to confirm or remind myself or discover what this rule actually is supposed to be. I just want to play the game, you know. And uh, as one YouTuber who I, his name escapes me, but I'm sure I'll credit her in my review, uh, said, if you are having fun, you're doing it right. And that's, I think that's a wonderful philosophy for all solo games and certainly for For Against Darkness. Um... Okay, what do I want to do by way of introduction still before um, I finish up for today? Just have a few minutes left. Um, I think what I'll do is introduce you to the character... Oops! Introduce you to the character sheets here, or the character sheet that I'm using. Um, this is actually not an official thing, it's, but it's a, a well-respected resource on BoardGameGeek that a, a user came up with. And so... Um, my, I've got a four-party dungeon. You can vary that, but, I mean, it's called Four Against Darkness for a reason. And uh, Patience the Dwarf. That is a randomly generated name because uh, I started, you know, it's, it's easy to have your first-level characters die. <laughs> and so I just got a random fantasy name generator. For some reason, reason, his name is Patience. But he's gotten all the way up to level four at this point. The base game takes your characters up to level five. Um, I do have uh, expansion materials to take them beyond that, but I doubt that'll happen during the live streams this week. Patience the Dwarf is at level 4. Um, he's got a life of 9. When that runs out, of course, you're dead. You can be resurrected, but it is pricey. you got to consider if it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. Oh my gosh, is that my thing already? Okay, that's just to remind me to wrap things up. My wife and I are going to have lunch here, so i gotta, I got to wrap this up. Anyway, um... So I'll just I'll just look at this first character just so you can get an idea of how simple these stats really are. Uh, his attack he rolls a d6 that's the default plus his uh, level because he's a dwarf he gets that bonus so d6 plus four you add four to the result. Same with defense. Sorry I'm getting a little shaky cam going on here. My tripod I'm going to have to fix between today and tomorrow because it's uh, acting up in terms of its stability. Um, okay so. Uh, D6 plus 3, he adds that, I think, all exclusively because of his, um, his armor, uh, which you can buy armor that will, that, that will kind of level, level up your defense. Um, and then just some simple notes here about his special abilities that come with his class. Yes, the dwarf is both, both a race and a class in this one. Um, and so, so just some, some notes here, and then basic equipment, and then something to keep track of kind of uh, consumable things, like rations for other characters, like my wizard, that's where I kind of put their spells and keep track of that. So you find in this character sheet that it is not much more complex than a HeroQuest character sheet. It's very streamlined, and I find the game mechanics to be of a similar um, simplicity as far as the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay as HeroQuest. Uh, but as I said earlier, it's really wonderful to see how those simple mechanics can allow you to interact with the world in uh, in so many different ways. Um, so anyway, I, I am going to wrap up there, and I will start tomorrow, if you're watching the live stream version, I will start by reading the introduction to my Four Against Darkness campaign. I kind of wrote a little backstory. This game is not known for... Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's story qualities, but I knew my buddy that I played this game with uh, a couple weekends ago would really appreciate having some story. And I like some flavor too. I'll, as I play, introduce different ways that I have added flavor and story and other elements to this game that give it a little bit more lore and character and story context to the dungeon crawling, even though at the end of the day, that's really the meat and potatoes that I am in this experience for. So uh, anyway, if you're watching the live stream, I hope that you will come back and join me for uh, more Four Against Darkness as we really get into it tomorrow. Okay. Well, good morning uh, if you're watching this live. This is day three of Solo Tabletop Dungeon Fest, as I call it, for 2022. And we are right back into Four Against Darkness, which I gave a brief 
general introduction to yesterday. I'm going to try and just kind of get right into it. Um, first, I'm going to introduce uh, the campaign story that I came up with to kind of just add a little bit of context, a little bit of flavor, um, both for me and for the friend that I introduced this game to and uh, get together with uh, about twice a year for big tabletop gaming weekends. We found that this is the first game, I think, in years that we just it played exclusively the whole weekend. Uh, we haven't had a game like that since first edition Descent. So anyway, we had a great time with this. So uh, what I'm calling the Four Against Darkness campaign introduction reads, It is a time of growing unrest in the land. Tensions have steadily risen over the last ten years. An epidemic of societal conflict has spread everywhere in the empire. From the smallest village to the most economically important cities, those who were once friendly neighbors now fight with and distrust each other. Racial tensions between humans, dwarves, elves, and half-orcs have increased. Crime is on the rise everywhere, and no one seems able to determine why. In the halls of scholars and mages, there are whispers referring to a dark age long ago when a great unnamed evil took hold of the world. Not in a thunderous battle or cataclysmic war, but through subtler means and powers. An otherworldly evil who brought the world to the brink of self-destruction by a silent assault on the mind. By the time it revealed its true self, its true name, the people of the world were not merely unable to resist, but they welcomed their dark emperor, seeing him in their warped minds as a figure of virtue. It was a horrifying age that lasted thousands of years, and yet is still remembered only as legend. Its terrible particulars and how it came to an end are all details lost to memory, as those who emerged from it thought it best forgotten and stricken from record, that we might never be tempted to return to such a time under such a ruler. And yet now some believe the Dark Emperor is making moves to reemerge, preparing the world through his subtle, terrible, and unrecognized influence. Not knowing how this evil might be faced and defeated, you are among those who have chosen to embrace a life of adventuring and mercenary work, to hone your skills while also exploring the depths of the forgotten world in hopes that you might discover the true nature of the evil creeping in our minds, and along the way obtain the means to defeat it once and for all. So basically, the context I have for this, it's got a little bit of a Lovecraftian vibe, Definitely some parallels to uh, where we are at in terms of tensions in uh, Western culture today. Uh, but it's rather than like a big, bad Sauron kind of thing, uh, it's almost a Lovecraftian kind of thing that's like uh, creeping at the corners of everyone's minds and causing everyone to fight amongst each other and uh, self-destruct and stuff like that. And so uh, the there's a movement... A kind of a cultural movement in this fantasy world where a, cro a certain cross-section of people sense that there's an evil that needs to be defeated. They don't know how. They don't know how to pinpoint it and go and attack it like it's some big boss. They don't really know what to do. Uh, but they believe that this that the answer is in the long forgotten past, and so the the reason the motivation for the dungeon delves is to explore many of these long forgotten regions that have become overrun by monsters and uh, were part of things lost to memory that might give some clue about the evil that we face, um, and not knowing really what else to do. Uh, People are just taking, a, you know, a small minority, uh, but significant minority of the culture are are taking to this practice of adventuring and creating guilds and just to hone skills because not knowing what skills might be needed in this ultimate fight against this big bad, what's being referred to only as the Dark Emperor, um, not knowing what skills they might need, these adventurers are just kind of all honing all the skills that they have until they can figure out what exactly needs to be done. Now, in kind of like my campaign plan, when all party members reach level 5 or higher, there's an event that triggers that gives a little bit more instruction and insight as to what the heroes will need to do 
to more specifically prepare for a, a final conflict with the big bad. Uh, Four Against Darkness in its base set uh, will take characters up through level five. And my adventuring party that I'm dealing with right now is uh, all level three except for one who's level four. And it does, based on the mechanics of the game, take a little bit longer to advance in levels after you get you know, to level three or level four because what you do when you have the the um, right amount of XP or the right circumstances to do an XP roll to level up is you roll a D6, and if you roll a number higher than your current level, you go up one level. Uh, and of course, that's going to be easier at the beginning, a little bit harder and slower as you go on. So um, even though I'm at level four and three, I'm not necessarily thinking I'll do much leveling up um, during the, the live stream today and tomorrow. But... Uh, I'm going to introduce now um, the the guild that I'm uh, creating. You can just play this as a standard, you know, dungeon crawl using graph paper and whatnot. Um, but I've noticed that some other players, and I really like this idea, and so I, I stole their ideas. As a, uh, it's kind of common, I think there's just lots of neat ideas being generated in the Four Against Darkness online community. People are using each other's ideas and building on them and stuff, and so. Um, I've seen the, at least one person use this idea of a, of a guild that you are running so that you're not really just a party of adventurers or any one of these adventurers that you might take into a dungeon in particular. You are kind of masterminding a guild. Similar to, I think, of the game Four Against Darkness, where ultimately you aren't the heroes that are going into the dungeons. You are kind of overseeing this guild that uh, members come and go from, you know, they, they uh, enter, they level up, they die, that kind of thing. So, um, so I'm, I've got a record here, I'm keeping track of guild resources, basically the, the coin that I might bring back from adventures I keep track of here, so currently I'm at, it uh, looks like 187, um, and you do want to uh, kind of keep a bank like this, uh, or at least, you know, it's advantageous to you because your characters can only carry so many coins into the dungeon. Each character can carry 200 coins. You can carry an unlimited number of other things that might be worth coins, such as gems, jewelry, things like that. But the actual coinage that you have is limited to 200, or beyond that, you start suffering penalties while you are exploring in the dungeon. Um, and so there's this idea of having a bank that you can put your excess gold uh, in between adventures, um, and then also this idea of a vault, uh, which I, I thought was really neat. I want to say um, the YouTuber's name again, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm going to uh, make sure to credit her um, in my review. Uh, Liv is her name, L-I-V. I don't know, Liv plays, Liv, if you just do Liv, L-I-V, and then Four Against Darkness, you'll find her YouTube channel. Anyway, she does some great stuff on this. Uh, sorry, I can't remember uh, her full YouTube channel right now. But anyway, so excess equipment and stuff that I find, I put here in case I want to sell it later or give it to a new adventure or something like that. And then also down here I've got guild properties because I'm using um, uh, another fan-made expansion which has like some 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 campaign plots and one of those campaign campaign plots is burned village where you are as part of your uh, overarching campaign and things that you're trying to accomplish that don't have to do with dungeon crawling sort of like the um, the overworld type stuff in descent first edition road to legend in that expansion the stuff that you're doing outside of the dungeons um, you know that, that's uh, kind of what this is about but uh, thematically, the original idea is that your village is discovered, destroyed, and you need to build it up over time, and you get advantages of uh, certain things that you can buy. If you build, say, a school, uh, or if you build an armory, then that allows you to buy and sell equipment and stuff. And so instead, I'm using these mechanics, but putting a different theme on it, that of making buildings for my guild. Um, and once I have a building built, I decided that will mean that I can now get a 10% discount at whatever that thing offers. Although in the meantime, I can um, get the services that I might want in the city. And this is another fan-made expansion that uh, has uh, uh, different buildings, a guild, blacksmith, uh, mage tower, temple, marketplace. Um, and you can visit these places in between your adventures and uh, buy different things. Um, 
this is all a lot of this is all available and even you know kind of referenced here in other books uh, the, like the core rule book or uh, uh, what's I can't remember what some of these other ones come there's four against the abyss is another one I can't remember what some of these other uh, letters referred to but they're they're all referring to different um, expansions for the game um, so this is just kind of a different way of organizing it and and kind of stamping a different theme on it uh, which I really liked um, I don't really want to do a bunch of stuff outside of the uh, certainly not like interacting with NPCs I'm not really in this for I mean I can't be in it for role-playing as a solo player uh, but I can a little bit in the sense of like my head can and what what's going on in this world so um, so, of course, as I'm dungeon crawling, I'm getting new resources to upgrade my party members and then my guild members, some of which, you know, maybe are staying behind. Um, but I'm also looking to get uh, a surplus um, gold and uh, resources and stuff to build up my guild itself for some long-term advantages. Um, here is uh, the, the, the roster for my guild. Eldorast, if there is a character that I'm playing, it's Eldorast. He's the wizard I uh, like to play as that I came up with years ago in any game that allows me to play as a dedicated magic user. So, And he is also the only character that I allow to kind of reincarnate. If he dies, I allow myself to bring in a replacement wizard uh, that, yes, does still have to start at level 1, but I can still call him Eldorast, and, uh, <laughs> and he's just kind of frustratingly reincarnated, cursed with some bizarre form of immortality. Um, but other ones I just allow to die and then be replaced. Uh, so Dogren Scarbor was uh, my first dwarf, and he was turned to stone by a Medusa. And, and I like this uh, aspect. There's an aspect of record-keeping that's uh, encouraged by a couple different people out there making content for this game that I really agree with and, and find uh, that it enriches, it enriches, I don't know if that's a word, enriches, I'm pretty sure that might be better, uh, enriches the experience, um, and, you know, because you're just playing by yourself. But if you have, if you keep some kind of record of the things that happened, since you don't have a friend to go back and reminisce about what happened on that such and such time that we were playing, then you can have these other little things, these other brief little records that you keep to remind you of the adventures that you've had. And it, and it also helps to create a sense of lore for the world that you're slowly building as you play. I don't do it. Some people will do some extensive journaling and stuff. I don't do that. But I just, just simple things like this. Turn to Dogren Scarbor, Dwarf made it to level one before he was turned to stone by a Medusa. Same adventure, Marcus the Cleric got turned into stone by Medusa. It was the same Medusa. Uh, I, I turned around and ran out of that dungeon pretty quick after that. Um, but I am keeping track uh, of, let's see, oh, actually, no, yeah, Griffith, level three, Patience, Du Bois. These are ran randomly generated names. <laughs> Patience, I hate that name because uh, my dwarf is kind of my fighter, but he's been hanging on, um, so I'm stuck with it, and maybe for a while, but Patience Du Bois is the name of my dwarf, level 4. I've got uh, Griffith Rebek is my cleric at level 3, Shaden, my rogue at level 3, and of course Eldorast, my wizard, uh, also at level 3. Um, and let's see here. Oh, over here, this is a table that I've been working on that helps me to generate dungeons um, by creating a different theme that will help me determine what my enemy loadout might be because I've acquired a lot of different uh, uh, enemy stats and so now I like to mix and match and create something that's a little bit more thematic and consistent uh, when I'm uh, generating a dungeon and you'll see how that works in just a little bit here. Uh, and then this is um, also something that I uh, stole from somebody else. It's uh, just well, actually, I'm trying to think. This might... I can't remember if this is actually in the rules somewhere. Anyway, um, based on what your current guild level is, you can hire new adventurers to replace lost ones that don't start at level 1. It just costs some coin, um, and you're limited based on the average level of all your current living guild members. So, anyway, that's kind of a basic overview um, of, uh, of kind of the out of the dungeon type of experience for this game. Um, so now let's go ahead and generate a quest. 
It is time again for Christian Geek Central's annual Game Save event, fundraising for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, which provides free treatment for children facing life or death circumstances and shares its cutting edge life saving research with hospitals all over the world. You're still welcome to join the Game Save team by following the link in the description below. And once again this year, I'm drawing attention to our team's fundraising by performing a 24 hour marathon of video gaming that I will stream live on youtube.com slash Christian Geek Central beginning 6 a.m. Pacific Time on Saturday, November 5th. You can donate or get more info by clicking on my fundraising page in the links below where you'll also find incentives and rewards for doing so. For $5, choose a topic for me to share my sometimes overly strong opinions on during my live stream. For $10, you get the previous reward and a download code for a free copy of the Spirit Blade Special Edition audio drama. For $20, you get the previous rewards and you can choose a game for me to play during my November 5th live stream, pick a favorite, or torture me with something terrible or rage-inducingly difficult. For $30, you get the previous rewards and you can choose a song for me to sing during my November 5th live stream, pick an old favorite of yours, or just make me humiliate and torture myself with something no one wants to hear. And for $50, you get the previous rewards and a download code for every MP3 product at spiritblade.com. That's a $90 value. On top of that, I have set fundraising milestones that will unlock strange and unusual happenings as I reach them. Now, there are some stipulations and time limits on those rewards and milestones, so quickly follow the link below to my fundraising page for all the details. I hope you'll be a part of helping me and the Christian Geek Central Game Save team do some good for some kids who really need it. Uh, and then please join me at youtube.com slash Christian Geek Central for my 24-hour marathon starting at 6 a.m. Pacific Time on Saturday, November 5th. Hope to see you then. <laughs> oh my gosh. This is all kinds of wrong.